Okay, so this is First Steps with Observability Open Telemetry and you. I am Noshnika Malafera. Um, the good people at Signadot were so good as to pay for me to come out. I mentioned them in one slide. This is, has nothing to do with Signadot, so that's the nice part is I get to actually talk about stuff that I care about. Um, in this case, Open Telemetry. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. This is definitely targeted at people who are starting at looking at observability problems on big or small stacks. So that's, that's where the, 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 the targeting is. So when we use this term observability, what are we talking about? It's a very big buzzword like on the West Coast. You'll hear some very smart people use it all the time. Other people will use terms like monitoring or um, some sort of initialism like APM or something. Um, so what's the distinction or what are we trying to show with this term? Um, we want to think about a time to understanding. So this, if you don't recognize it, is the Voynich manuscript, which is a handmade manuscript full of indecipherable both diagrams and writing um, in a language nobody's ever seen or using characters nobody's ever seen anyplace else. So our time to understanding on the Voynich manuscript is currently at about 645 years and we're still not fully aware of what's in there. Um, so, time to understanding is the first half of our mean time to resolution, usually, right? Um, but it is possible to have a fix with zero understanding, right? We have memory overrun, we reset the server, we're good to go, right? We never understood where that memory was leaking from. It's like a classic example of like, hey, we have relatively low observability to the system. But I would submit that while fixes are absolutely possible, without understanding, the stress level during incidents becomes extremely high, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, back in the day, maybe you would, oh, let's just go ahead and create a cron job, just go ahead and restart the service every 24 hours, right? We're all, and, you know, even then our stress level was high, <laughs> right? Even when it was like, oh yeah, sorry, it's just, you know, between 2 and 2.05 a.m., it's just when everything restarts, right? Not great. But when we're, when we're working on a new issue and we do not understand what's going on, even if we say, oh yeah, adding resources to this or that fixes it, our, our stress is quite high and that takes its wear on the team. So why are microservices particularly harder for this? So this is, this is something that's critical to understand is that a microservice architecture is often presented as simply the evolution of a monolithic architecture, right? It is something that you will grow into as you as your palate matures and you start drinking whiskey, you're going to enjoy microservices. But this is an area where microservices absolutely are worse. So that is in observability, right? Initially, in the era of the monolith, obviously, there were only a few people in your org who fully understood the pieces of the monolith even somewhat, right? By the time all of those people ended up on a conference call at 2 a.m., the problem was generally understood completely. Right? There were only so many services to interact. They were interacting in weird ways and had weird historical reasons for acting the way it did. But the monolith could be fully understood. And so the simplest version of that is, right, you can get something like a stack trace, shows you everything that's on the stack when you had this problem. Right? And so you could get to some understanding eventually, even though it might be quite slow to fully understand uh, where the system was in its state. This is an image from D zone. Now, you know, the AWS or the Amazon.com Death Star is not that surprising. The Netflix one kind of does get me, though, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I, I would think, you know, if only I could, uh, you know, activate my, my Elon persona and be like, yeah, I can figure out how Netflix works. I'll just put it on a whiteboard, right? But then you get this, right? So with microservices, right, you very, very quickly build up a number of connections that make it largely impossible to understand the system completely. When I say understand the system completely, think about questions like, if surface A goes down, will service B be affected, right? Which in monolith days, right, you, you felt like you pretty much had a handle on. Um, now, the only, my only problem with this graphic is, is it is two very, very large services that we understand, like, hey, this is about as big as, as it gets currently for complexity. But this will happen once you have a dozen developers, right? This is not something that's going to happen uh, just only with massive mega scale, right? It's something that generally does happen with Microsoft projects. And that makes some sense, right? That's almost the contract, right? I understand only my component. My component fulfills its contracts correctly. 
right? And so the map of the connectome between those uh, services is not something that anyone is charged with fully understanding. And I could say more about that organizationally, that like when you create a team that's supposed to understand the whole service, often their job is just to guilt and apologize within the, <laughs> they apologize to the customer and they guilt us about making something that doesn't work. But they do, they, you know, again, because they are not within those, embedded inside those teams, they, they also struggle to understand that map. So we get this kind of Tower of Babel, right, where, uh, you know, everybody has their own project, their own project is fully functional within their own testing and their own observation. But when operated together, there are unexpected results which are very, very hard to track down. So open telemetry exists explicitly to address this problem. And that matters because as we get into a little bit of the technical side of this, um, we're going to get to a point where we're like, wow, we're doing this in kind of a heavy way. <laughs> When we're like trying to go like, hey, let's go report a single metric with open telemetry, it's like, oh, there's a few steps here. And that's because open telemetry is not an open source project to report a metric, a single log line, or a, a, a very simple trace in the easiest way possible. It's gonna try and give us a window into microservice architecture. There are still great benefits from open source observability, even if you have like a, 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 a a much simpler map, but this is what open telemetry is written to address. And think about this slide, especially when we talk about tracing and we talk about distributed tracing as like, this is what we came back to. Now I'll note that there's, there's been some new news. I've been doing this talk for a little while or a version of it for a couple of years, but there is some new news out here, right? Where uh, initially when I would say, hey, microservices are just one of the solutions to an engineering problem, and they have, they have no special claim on being a superior solution, that was like a fun, freaky idea, right? Now this is <laughs> uh, filtering out a little bit. That like super duper lightweight services that you can spin up very, very easily, maintain on your own, and can interact in this predictable way that we are seeing the kind of vagaries of that engineering approach. It was a great talk this morning talking about sidecar implementations, and again, it's like, oh, this is a super clean way to implement these sidecars, do all this kind of uh, network level control, adding you know, milliseconds of latency on every single request between every single service, right? And so that stuff added up at Prime Video. So um, this is not, in fact, like internecine fighting at Prime Video that they're complaining about uh, Lambda implementation. They're merely observing that the benefits of a microservice architecture did not necessarily result in engineering benefits. That makes some sense because when microservices were initially presented to us, the idea was not faster, better, cheaper. The idea was not, oh, this uses less RAM than another approach. The idea was your team can fully understand what they're working on and they don't have to get blocked by unexpected interactions with other chunks of code that are dependencies for their work. Right, that was the benefit. The benefit was not, oh, this runs so much better. Um, if you're listening to this, I'll do the, uh, 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 just reading this headline, right? Scaling up the Prime Video Audio Video Monitoring Service and reducing costs by 90%. So a move away from distributed microservices architecture to a monolith application helped achieve higher scale resilience and reduce costs. Again, that actually should not be a surprise. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, to those of us who've been around long enough, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so off from that little moment of just saying, maybe we shouldn't do microservices at all, to how do we monitor microservices? So we think about monitoring in the open telemetry space and in most spaces as having three pillars of observability. This is three pillars by Kandinsky, uh, public domain. So I've got to work it into every single talk where I get to talk about the three pillars. So we start with the second one that came about. I should change this order because I should put it in order of like when these were, were useful. But we start with metrics, right? Which is our just sort of counting something that's going on. Um, some metrics are emitted very naturally from any system, right? Things like memory overhead. And they are our best way to get a high level view of what is going on, right? They very rarely are going to point to a root cause. So the classic is pegging CPU, memory, memory usage, getting out of control, right? That that is going to say, hey, we know something's going on on this machine. We have no idea what it might be. We know the shape of the effect of it, but not the cause. 
Uh, the other big advantage of uh, metrics is they should be very, very uh, lightweight for storage impact, right? We should be able to do math on them. We should have a little bit of compression on them to be able to get a ton of information in a nice compact package. More on that later when we talk about the cardinality of data. And then logs, kind of an irony with logs, all of your answers are there, right? Somewhere in the library of Babel, there is a book that has every truth, right? Um, but somewhere, right? Um, logs are an interesting one because they are a really good example of how you can increase the level of monitoring that you're doing and reduce your observability. So if observability is your mean time to understanding a problem, right? Throwing your production system over into debug will get you more information but it will reduce the likelihood that you can find that information. So you can hurt your observability by monitoring more. Um, and in general, right, logs present some kind of storage problem for you. Five years ago, Splunk was like, don't worry about it. And then a year later, Splunk was like, worry about it. So, you know. Um, and then the last is tracing, right? Informatically, right, this is a hybrid between metrics and logging. And you're trying to generalize observed time spans. So I, I, we're going to talk more about tracing, uh, I promise. So let's, let's, let's dive into um, tracing this like newest member of the Troika. So I'll start with the dirty secret about tracing, which is that most tracing is never viewed in its full detail. And by most, it's like 99.9%. .9%. And somehow, that's not super surprising about logs, right? Like, there might be info logs that you log all the time that you're not that surprised that you don't read them. But when you go to all the trouble of creating these traces, and you start to realize, like, oh, some services, we never look at these traces. And they could be relatively quite dense with data, but we almost never look at them. And maybe I should move this later in the stack, but this is something I kind of want to start with, because as we're doing our work for traces, we kind of want to keep in mind that something needs to tell us to go to a particular trace or something needs to generalize for those traces for them to be super useful. Because otherwise, we're kind of recapitulating the logs problem, where it's like somewhere, somewhere there is, there is a trace that shows this problem. And you know, at 10 AM the next morning, you're going to find it. But you're not going to find it during an incident. So the idea with tracing is that I'm going to skip around very slightly in my little chart. Um, our goal of tracing is some kind of waterfall chart, which involves both some kind of object telling us what's going on, uh, hopefully with some parameters that are on the stack, the service that's touched, and the time span that that service is taking up. So one of the funny things about tracing, ah, I'll get to that in a minute. So yeah, one of the funny things about tracing is uh, when I was first working with tracing six, seven years ago, um, you know, I was showing people, oh, here's how to get all these time spans to decorate these time spans to get them to be more accurate, to add more uh, measures of time to them, that waterfall chart being more and more dense. And what they started asking for was something that looked kind of like this. They just said, I just want to know which services got hit during the tracing. And when we think back to that problem of do we understand how our microservice architecture works, you can see why, right? Because the very question is just sort of, what is reliant on what? You know, what, what is going to fail if I take service B down, right? So this is one of the reasons why actual tracing data is viewed so rarely, is because often what people actually want from tracing data is just where did this request go? And they're not as interested in what's causing the latency, exactly how much latency was it, what you know, individual Java method within the stack was the thing that was running so slowly. It's just, oh, if you do a checkout thing, then the profile service gets called. I didn't know that, right? And that's often what we want from tracing. So that gets us to this concept of distributed tracing. So distributed tracing is the idea you're not just looking at a trace for you know, a request passing through a single service, but you're able to see some kind of interconnected version of that service. I'm going to slip my reading glasses on, so apologies to you all if this is tiny to you as well. Um, yeah, so the problem that you face when you try to do this kind of tracing is passing around data consistently, right? That shows which transaction this was. So pre-open um, tracing, open telemetry days, this was all we talked about when we would do closed source tracing. 
is like, okay, you're going to have to add some code to add a header. And maybe you'll be doing some stuff asynchronously. You're not going to be totally sure what the header is. So you got to check it at the end to find this header. But you got to pass it around. And when you pass it on to a new service, you have something that receives this new header that tags things correctly, that deals with inconsistencies within these headers. This is kind of the key question to make distributed tracing work effectively. Uh, other problems that can arise if we sort of look at this from a computer science standpoint, like issues with timing and asynchrony and invalid time values, negative time values and stuff, those all can cause us trouble in a rigidly typed system, but they're very rarely the problem. The problem is, hey, it gets passed into the one service, this service strips out the headers, or I cannot meaningfully interact with the service to add that kind of header information, and so then the information gets lost. And so a big chunk of our trace is just here, it's going into a black box, and I don't know what's happening with it. Um, and that'll still happen, but hopefully less so with this project. So this is why we have the OpenTelemetry project is an attempt to create a consistent standard for passing that information around. So we want to add a trace header somewhere close to the quote unquote start. And then we want to have collector side logic to tie those traces together. And that's, that's really major, right? Because you might be doing something like kicking off a delayed job or some kind of other asynchronous work where you're really going to be after the fact that you're like, oh, this was all kicked off by this request. So you want some kind of logic where you're gathering data to see where these are connected. How are we doing on time? Not great, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So that gets us to the collector. So um, the Open Telemetry Collector is a service that can be run in a whole lot of places. But, and this is from the OpenTelemetry.io documentation. Um, thank you so much for this really elegant draw. Uh, uh, representation of this. You can have your open telemetry library just immediately ship out its metrics out to um, uh, whatever other service. Say, oh, go ahead and report this metric every time you see it. And that can make sense for test cases and for very small implementations. Or if you want, what you want to send is like business intelligence, like, oh yeah, we sold something for $4. Just go ahead and report that directly to a service. And that's probably fine if you have a web request per purchase, that's, that's okay. But what you want to do otherwise in a larger system is you at some point want to consolidate data on your side before you're sending it across the wire. And that can be within these containers, it can be within your network, it can be run a whole bunch of ways, but, but this very generalized idea is that you have this collector. And so this is that graphic, but bigger. What was I thinking here? Oh, right. So, um, no. Don't know how we got the slide in twice. That's okay. Because within that collector, you can add some logic in this really nice modular way. We'll see an example config for this in a little bit. But along with the collector's innate ability to stitch together distributed traces, you can do things like you can debounce your data, you can set a polling length, you can set a maximum memory size, you can pull out personally identifiable information, all really nice stuff that it's nice to be able to do. And you should be able to configure that in a, in a pretty uh, effortless way with a, with a very consistent YAML configuration pattern. And we'll see an example configuration in just a minute. So when we go about reporting data, I don't think that there's too much that we need to worry about data engineering right off the top. That we say, oh, we, have, you know, we're, we don't need to do a ton of pre-optimization to begin with, but when we want to report, especially when we want to report metrics, it's worth considering this one thing, which is high cardinality data. So let's look, this is just a sample uh, you know, spreadsheet that I built of some performance information that shows a series of you know, page paths, how well they perform, how much money they produce, a few other things. I think I pulled this from real analytics in some ways. Um, looks pretty good, right? Seems like it could be fairly actionable if we're like front-end developers, like, oh, this is good for us to know. So this is less useful, right? Every single, in the, in the value for path, every single user ID is now getting encoded. But this is more information, right? So this is good. Well, right, it's not, right? It's much less useful. And this is, the issue is that we now have a, um, 
subject variable that says, hey, this is what, this is what bucket this should go into, that has become highly, highly specific. And the rest of the values are all going to be pretty standard, right? The number of hits that it's going to receive is usually going to be one between one and five, right? So we have switched from relatively high cardinality data, where there's a very, uh, an extreme amount of variability in the number of hits, the number of traffic that goes to each of these paths, to relatively low cardinality data. And this I found in my work with large implementations of observability and other forms of, of instrumentation was actually surprisingly difficult to sell to the org or had to be communicated fairly early. As, remember, we do not want to be pushing just the most detailed, for example, name, metric name, or uh, metric value. We, we, we want to have a lot of possible values for the metrics within that, the metric name, we want to be fairly standard. Because even if you're a front-end engineer, it's very likely that actually all these paths could just be like a page. Right? It's, it's not terribly likely that doc slash index is performing that differently from some other, you know, like that's not the most likely thing. So it, it's worth thinking about what is a more general name that I can give to these metrics. Uh, and then I just have, I guess, a demonstration of that. Okay, let's talk about how we can get started with sending some data. This is from uh, the AWS blog, AWS engineering blog, thinking about how we're going to send our data. One of the concepts to think about is that if we use something like Prometheus to gather our metrics from OpenTelemetry, we can actually grab and pull that Prometheus data to take operational action. So that's kind of this new idea that AWS are thinking about and that may be actionable in the next couple of years may come to be a very key part of the story. And one thing to think about is where we're going to send this information in the end. A standard tutorial that you will find that's like for hackers and boot campers and people just starting out will be sending that data to like a Prometheus and Grafana service, right? Prometheus to store and, and let you query that data and Grafana to let you represent it. Um, that is what you should do if you're going to try it out this weekend and try and build something yourself. It's really good to understand how that works. If you're implementing it for a team, it's worth thinking about these things around storing your performance data out of OpenTelemetry. So you have your storage maintenance stuff, right? Are you rotating your storage? What are you doing if you have metric explosions? So the example where you have every metric name is a you know, path right down to the user or includes the UTM or some other value that you really don't want. What do you do when your database stops working as a result, right? Do you have to do the maintenance to clamp that? And then if you're information, if, you're, if your observability is useful, then you're going to deal with the problem of trying to share that information, um, which can get quite stressful quite quickly. So the first is like accounts and access, right, where you, you build it up yourself and you're like, oh, cool, just use this info to log in. Then you start realizing that contractors and other people have that login info and maybe it wasn't all, maybe it wasn't you know, quite telling about the state of your business, so you get a little stressed out about that. And then the last is just building visualizations that are useful. So, you know, for myself, right, once I have the CSV open, I can say, hey, look, you see this pattern here. But once we start wanting to share it around the org, it's really good to think about what kind of visualizations you're using so that everybody can look at it and pick that up rather quickly. Okay, so let's see some demo code and demo config. So, uh, apologize, readability is like not great with this. Um, the concept here is that we're just going to go ahead and install very basic instrumentation on like a Node.js service. So we're going to start by implementing the OpenTelemetry node project, which will give us a few standard pieces to report metrics and trace spans. Then we're able to say, hey, we want to register a trace, and then we want to add a span to that trace. And then we can also create a meter, create something that, me that, that measures metrics and increment some kind of counter on that meter. There's a whole bunch of subtlety about how you implement metrics, things like you maybe you want metrics to just increase by one every time you call them, or you want to, them to increase by a certain value, or want them to go to a certain value. And uh, it's worth thinking about, though I don't have a separate slide on this, um, if you're diving really deep into the way that metrics are implemented within a single service, ask yourself, is that logic that should actually be happening on the collector side? So, for example, your service may see that you sold four pairs of boots today on its service, and so it may want to update that metric to four, 
right? But you realize, oh, wait, I have other things running that also sell boots, right? And then you start saying, oh, okay, I guess I'll communicate with the other ones and check out, mm -mm. This is the time to start thinking about that collector, right? A central point where all this data is gathered. And it can totally have logic to say, hey, I want to sum these values. I want to receive these values separately and increment them separately. So yeah, if you're diving really deep into how metrics are implemented on one service, think about collector side logic. So let's look at an example, collector config. This is about as basic as it gets. So here we have it setting up to receive metric data on two ports and then how it's going to process that data, and this stuff is kind of critical. So it's gonna say, hey, how long do I wait to send that data? And what kind of batch size am I going to send? So this prevents it, even if you have some service that is inadvertently like incrementing a metric every single millisecond, it's, this prevents it from trying to send every single millisecond as well. Um, it also has a check interval and a memory limiter, both for the same value. If you have something like metric explosion where you're producing a ton of metric names, it's gonna say, hey, I, I'm not gonna completely fill the memory of this service with these metric names. I'm gonna have a limit for how many I'll report. And again, you'll be surprised. That clamping can be hard to sell within your organization, right? I want to know everything. I want to observe everything, right? But this can really start to cause like overhead problems. Then you have an exporter, and I'll get to the concept of exporters in just a sec, and obviously we have this, uh, oh, yeah, so, export, so exporters think about uh, the endpoint that we're sending these values to. So one of the really nice things about implementing a collector early on is that you are completely divorced from where that metric data is going. So you stand up a Prometheus and Grafana instance at first to collect that data, that's fine but you're not totally stuck with that forever. You're not stuck with a DIY solution. And when you go out and buy a service, and, and frankly, everybody who does observability is saying, hey, I want to receive your open telemetry data. If you're sending it with just this endpoint config, then that's what's entailed in changing services, right? It's just changing that endpoint. You're gonna lose historical data, but that's pretty nice. That's, that's not much of a lift to do that kind of, uh, uh, um, migration. So we've seen a little bit of drama around that in the scene. Come and talk to me after this <laughs> if you want to hear about uh, drama about data going in to, to close teams. But um, yeah, and then we have our pipelines, which we have for logs, traces, and metrics. And we're going to find which processors we want those individual components to go through. So we can say, hey, for logs, we want to do all this PII destruction because we're worried about personal data. Not so much worried about that with metrics. And so we're going to implement that differently. So one thing to think about with the centrality of tracing, if you're exploring this as an option, is that this chart on the OpenTelemetry documentation, which is totally accurate, can be a little bit deceptive because uh, you know, when you say to yourself, well, you know, on Rails, should we launch something that doesn't support logs? You'd be like, no, <laughs> right? But that's, that's deceptive because you already have a way to export logs. Right, you probably already have a path to send logs over the wire. And you absolutely can, whatever you're using, send those into the collector and send them to their service. So yes, support is not yet native in several of these libraries or is just experimental in several of these libraries, but that doesn't mean that it's not ready to get used. And apologies, this is like not a live picture. I think a couple of these are updated, but the big thing is as long as traces are stable, you're probably in a good place to start using. Um, and so this isn't the whole chart. So a couple of these, I, I, two I think are not listed as stable yet for traces. Um, metrics, even these ones that are listed as experimental still work great. So worth checking out. Thank you so much. Um, don't worry, I'm nearly done, so we're good. Um, okay, so last little kind of niggling concepts. One is um, the concept of baggage. So most of the data that we're passing around as header values uh, is gonna be for the purpose of creating this observability information with these requests. But you still have the ability to say, hey, I'm gonna attach a little more information. Why? Don't worry about it. And it's kind of a negative term, baggage, but that's the deal, right? You can have a lot of interesting use cases for why you would wanna pass information around consistently for a request. For example, um, if you wanted to create an experimental version of one service within your cluster, 
but you still wanted to use your shared cluster to do all of your testing. You would want requests to go to your test cluster only when you needed them to, right? You would want normal requests to go to wherever they do normally. So you have up here, you have a B prime new version of our service. We want most of the A to B requests to go to B, but we want some of them, our test requests, to go to B prime. So um, uh, the people who paid for me to be here, Signodot, have uh, taken on this challenge and the way that they solved this because they wanted to pass information about requests all around their stack really, really fluidly and have a very easy way to pick up that information was with open telemetry baggage. So we're seeing a little bit of this now. We're seeing some open telemetry usage to solve like new problems in um, cluster engineering with like CICD or security. That's interesting stuff. We'll see where it goes. Right now, of course, most of open telemetry is for monitoring the observability. All right, thank you so much. Here's a giant version of my head. Uh, if we have questions, I will take them now. I'm, I'm gonna turn off the giant version of my head because I couldn't deal with it. You can find me on Twitter at serverless underscore mom. Okay, we have a question here. Hey, thanks very much. That was a great talk. Um, I wanted to double click a little bit on the uh, storage considerations you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you actually wanted to do this at, at scale, what are some, I guess, practical implementations that you've seen? So, uh, you know, the first thing that you should do is just engage at the very facile level with how the collector is working, because that's where your problems are actually going to start. That's where your, like, day one or day 10 problems are going to start, is you, can, you should just be setting memory limits, setting maximum uh, send sizes, and that's going to control, like, oh, we thought this was a good idea, and it went completely, out, completely haywire. More significantly, so you'll see some very large teams will present incredibly cool stuff. I just saw an Intuit presentation that absolutely blew my mind with what it did. Now, obviously, they have somebody who spends all of their time worrying about how their really, really cool metrics don't destroy their network storage bill or their network storage <laughs> devices or whatever else. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the point. For when you're getting started, it's really just about learning that collector logic even at a facile level, right, and clamping it, and realizing that when you do things like say, hey, never send more than five megabytes of trace data in a single cycle, most trace data is not viewed, right? So start by compensating a little bit more towards the, hey, let's just clamp exactly how much data we're gonna send in this cycle. Yeah, so I, actually, actually, my question was more of, let's say I didn't wanna do that, do, do you actually persist it to a database or an object uh, store, yeah, and, so and, and then, and then we can worry about the expo exposing Yeah, so none it. of that stuff is covered within the open telemetry project itself, right? So now you get over to like Prometheus engineering or using a surface. Myself, I do not think, uh, if you're over a certain size, then you're totally gonna be able to have full-time Prometheus people who can handle this stuff. Um, if you're under a certain size, I do not think that's a great idea. Um, and, and I think that you're gonna deal with a, a number of like storage management headaches eventually within a couple of quarters. So for that, there are several services, among them Honeycomb, which is a fantastic one, that will just be your endpoint. Um, I know there's Telemetry Hub, there's like four others. And so they will handle all these like storage headaches for you. And again, you're the one designated them as an open telemetry endpoint, so you get to feel very cocky when you go into sales negotiations with them at the end of the year, right? Because you're like, look, I can just change one config value, right, and start reporting someplace else. Thank you. All right, any more questions? We've got one over here. Hi, thank you. That was great. Um, so I'm curious. So you talked about the three pillars, tracing, logs, metrics. Mm -hmm. When you're going into There's a green... else. What's that? There is nothing else. <laughs> yes, only three. <sighs> um, when you're going into a greenfield project, how do you think about uh, you know building observability in that project? Are you just yeah. literally tracing everything and yeah. putting logs where it's relevant and metrics where the business cares? Yeah. Like, how, how do you think about that for a greenfield project? So I, I, I believe that I am not saying anything too surprising to say that actually, like, greenfield projects start out as monoliths. And, like, you know, when I was first learning, right, I learned both, like, microservice decomposition and even, like, function decomposition. And so, like, would make 11 functions to have my little video game character move forward a step, right? But... That all that is actually pre-optimization, right? It's like, no, just make one huge function called character updater, right? And and then later worry about that decomposition into into individual services. So, what does that mean for like, hey, you're working on a greenfield project? You know, it's going to grow to a certain size. It's not just like a, this is not a garage project. You know, it's going to have thousands of users. Um, 
I think the first thing to worry about is, yeah, tying together your first four services and making sure that distributed tracing is working between those four. Then you should be able to create a standard for any future implementations that they need to decorate their spans in a, in a custom way. Um, for many frameworks, if you just implement, the, they have auto instrumentation available, so you may do those for it and be like, hey, this just works out of the box. So that's what we expect for future services that we add to that stack. But you want to you wanna try to do that as we see, hey, can we get distributed tracing working such that it's seeing all four of those services and that we're having some kind of span information between those four services. Thank you. And ju just a follow-up question with tracing, how, I don't know the terminology for it, but how valuable do you find like dense traces going all the way down the stack of like yeah. our tiny little function that does this thing? Is that worth tracing down that point? Or? Yeah, so this is, this is definitely something that you're going to evolve as you grow with a tool. I, I would definitely say like one of my big takeaways from this is like that is not super valuable like ceteris paribus with like knowing not, not anything else about the situation. Like that like classic stack tracing within a service like Hopefully, once you've tied it to one service, that single two pizza team, because you're such a great microservices org, is going to look at that and be like, oh, I know what's going on, right? So that super deep depth may not make a ton of sense. Um, so, so worthwhile and great to have. And if it comes automatically, great. And let's, let's get it if we can. And great to have it documented for your team. So you can be like, oh, yeah, I know there's always going to be trouble with this sorting thing. So let me go ahead and you know, add some spans here. But that is not the first thing that you need out of the box, for sure. Hi. Um, two questions. First one is just more like a sunshine really need to get validated about open telemetry. So the way I've been trying to sell open telemetry was that because it's open source, it's open standard, am I correct to say like previously we've been using APMs, New Relic, Data Dog, and so on, but now open telemetry, I have that as the middle layer, and now I can switch to whichever network uh, monitoring provider I want. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that the correct? Yes, that is, that is how it should be. Okay. And, and, and almost everyone is on board with it being that way. Okay. Which is very surprising to a lot of my teams. Like, wow, yeah. really? All these guys are on, on board with this, but. Yeah. All right. I'll tell, I'll tell this right now. It's not, it's not any kind of secret that Datadog did have an incident recently where they talked to somebody who was building a tool to export some of the Datadog data to the open telemetry collector. And they like called his boss and was like, hey, can you pull this feature? It's like his side project was to, was to do this import. And, you know, you know, this is very much business metrics. We're none of it in, in this for love. But it's not a great look to say, hey, we love these open standards. Go ahead and feed us all this data with open standards. Bo, you'd like to look at our data with open standards? Absolutely not. <laughs> so that's not really, like, still they're asking you to implement by, hey, send us this data by setting, you know, Datadog or whoever as the endpoint and send it out to us. So you still are. If you, if you buy into open telemetry in your org, even if you're using a very big, expensive APM product, you still have the ability to say, hey, all this open telemetry stuff, we can just migrate, right? So that's fantastic. And that's sort of the, the point that I highlight is, however the kind of shilly-shally goes with, well, will they send their traces to our collector? Will they send their metrics and their auto instrumentation to our system? Maybe, maybe not. But anything you're sending with this nice collector config, you know you can migrate quite easily. Thanks. And the second, second question might be covered previously, but I'm trying to understand, like, if I was to tell my developers, like, yeah, add all these lines to these libraries, they'll say, like, well, I've got no time and so on. Yeah. Is there a way, like, out of the box, like, magically, it just reads? Yes. So in Java, Rails, Node, these libraries do it. In my example, you're, like, going in and saying, hey, add this span, instrument this method with this span. They all have some level of auto instrumentation implemented. So you're going to want to test that out. Obviously, you're going to, you know, especially if it's a ton of developers, you're going to want to try and test out what you can to see, like, what do I actually get out of the box? Um, most mature is Java, supergreatest.net. But then, like, how are we actually implementing? You just got to see. But I would say if you especially if you're using multiple languages, um, the degree that you would often get from closed source companies would be like, how well do you want to instrument this? They'd be like, fine, and then you get it, and it's not great. So same process, you need to run some kind of proof of concept. But yeah, this was the, as I got really deep in open telemetry, as I got started open telemetry two years ago, this was the part that really surprised me. It was like, oh, wow, you get a lot from auto instrumentation just out of the box without having to do anything more than just saying like, hey, go ahead and load the, load the uh, SDK here. And then like, oh, uh, here's where our request is starting. Maybe you tag that. But then you would get back like individual method names and stuff. So yeah, that, that's definitely worth, uh, worth checking out. Thank you.
right. One more question here. Apologies. Uh, we came a little late. I don't know whether this was already covered. Uh, you talked about all the greenfield kind of thing, right? So for a brownfield kind of application, we want to consume uh, telemetry, uh, either metrics, counters, or logs, which is already there in a brownfield old old application, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is that a viable option for open telemetry as well, do you think? Yeah, so what you're looking for there is an importer, right, that can say, hey, I want to consume this data, and that's a very active area of development. So the, the classic is this log, so you'll see in this, like framework support, a lot of them list like, oh, log support is really experimental. That just means that with this library, you may not have a call available to log to the collector, but there's tons of importers available for whatever logging tool you're using now. So um, that is a very, in this area, very active development. They're even doing it for closed source agents like the New Relic agents and the Datadog agents, so that's quite impressive. Um, so. I, I, you know, I don't mean to, to fall back to like, of course, you're going to require a proof of concept. You're going to look at the project. Um, there are some really big teams and especially really like, I don't know how to say very medium teams, like teams that are big, but not so big that they can afford to have a whole team of people worrying about this problem um, that have had real great success with that. So I know Shopify made this whole migration, was using some existing like uh, RPM tools, Rails performance management tools previously, and they were able to just get those imported into the collector and then sent up as open telemetry metrics. Thank you. And did I see another question over here? Or? You all had too many questions right. and that was so great and thank you so much. That's and good. it didn't stress me out at all. Thank you so much everybody for coming.